to to your point, the low barrier of entry on some of this stuff is it's kind of ridiculous. Like if somebody has a product and they're a seller on Amazon, dude, Amazon ads are cheap as shit because it's an underutilized ad platform. Everybody's trying to grab the Google search right. and push them to Amazon as opposed to advertising in the platform itself. Like, I wanna cause no problems. Mm. I just wanna live my life, but I keep on hearing about nonsense. Yeah. Me and my dons ain't mobsters, yeah. but you know when you see imposters. Yeah. We know how to read them faces, same way you know how to read them comments. If you wanna talk, let's talk, but around here, make sure you walk and your talk is constant. Well, hey everybody, welcome to the Death to Vanilla podcast where we talk about uh, courageously creating boldly innovating and experimenting and so i am on the call here with dennis uh he is most well known for brand producer uh but definitely has a lot of other things going on with his own podcasts and different business ventures that he's up to and he's someone that has always caught my eye of doing things boldly differently being authentic uh and vulnerable and honest about who he is and uh you know we we kind of look at someone like a Gary V as kind of being like the most public pioneer of that, like where he's wearing hoodies to professional meetings and everyone's like, what the heck's going on? Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's funny how that we're kind of trending just even culturally to that. And I think that's really exciting because that is part of what makes hiring someone like you or me or the guy down the street so much more different that they're actually embracing who they are. And that's part of the business experience. And it always has been. It's just never been public, right? So, yeah. So, if you could just uh, if you could just do a little introduction about yourself and what you do with Brand Producer, I think that would be a great place to kick off. Sure. Uh, my name is Dennis Gable, like you mentioned. And Brand Producer came out of a really low point in life. Um, I was essentially failing as a freelance designer and knew that my what i actually the gift i actually gave to clients was never the design mm -hmm. i'm about as mediocre of a designer as you can find and so what what i what i started to notice that clients really cared about was the way in which i could strategically look at their problem and offer a solution and then in a lot of cases i was providing that solution and still do in some way but um brand producer was built because i was watching a documentary and I watched an interaction between Rick Rubin and Jay-Z and the way that Rick Rubin came in and just offered what he wanted Jay-Z to do. Jay-Z was in on it. Rick Rubin walked away and I literally was sitting there on my couch and I went, that's what I do. I'm the brand producer. And the next day I created all the assets for it. And so it was this like shotgun Hail Mary sort of uh, business play. And right. I'm very grateful and fortunate that it, it worked and is working. It's funny how easy something is when it just clicks, when it finally hits that spot. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's me. Like, and it's so funny because it's one of those things where sometimes you have to have that like outside validation to realize that like you're not crazy, that like it finally exposes what's really going on. And that's always super exciting. But it's you struggle for years and years and all of a sudden something clicks and it's like and then everything changes. And that kind of sounds like that's what happened with you. 100%. 100%. It set me on fire, man. It was, it, you know, really to, to step into something like brand producer, where initially I didn't start quite as bold as I am now. Initially, mm -hmm. I was like, I'll manage your social and I'll design your things and I'll, I'll kind of be everything to everyone. But it was the narrative around being the producer that I think people really enjoyed and caught on to. And I've leaned so far into that. Like, if you go to my site, uh, my three services are identified by album, single, and a mixtape. I saw that, yes. And so, you know, I've, I've leaned so heavy into that. Um, I have actually, I made a an album cover that has me on the front and then my services on the back, like a full 12 by 12 <laughs> album cover. So, That's you know, cool. I've, leaned, I've leaned super heavy into that. And, and uh, you know, it, it lends itself to my general philosophy, philosophy about marketing and why it matters in the first place. Right, which is, if you want to unpack that just a little bit. Sure. Um, I think there are enough people in the world who are willing to follow the status quo in general. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. whether it be fashion or whether it be politics or whether it be religion or whether it be how we choose to live our lives, um, but certainly in marketing. Um, and you see it as you look at the trends of industries. Um, the real estate industry markets itself sort of in one direction. Um, 
the restaurant industry typically markets itself in one direction. And we see these, these lanes of marketing. And I like to just wipe that shit all away and say, who are we trying to get to? And what is the individual authentic piece of your, your story or your offering? And how do we get that to them in a, in a variety of ways? Um, you had mentioned before we, we started talking, um, the bus stop that I just created for mm -hmm. one of my clients. And I'm not afraid of traditional media. If it makes sense, if right. traditional media in, in your key demographic is somebody who's going to drive by this particular bus stop that has one of the panels is hot pink. So it's, it, it's different for me. You know, my client actually for that piece was like, I'm not comfortable with this. And I was like, what do you mean you're not comfortable with this? He's like, it's too bright and it doesn't feel professional enough. Mm. And I said, do you want to be professional or do you want somebody to call you? Yeah. And he said, I want somebody to call me, you know, like that, <laughs> that's, and so really it's, it's always a little bit of psychology when I push the limits so far. Um, but I, the type of media is irrelevant to me, honestly, if, if we know that there, there are numbers that support your target demographic, seeing it, let's do digital and let's do social and let's do a mailer and let's do a bus stop and let's do a magazine and let's do a newspaper and let's get you on the television. Because that funnel um, sort of idea is, uh, think of it like um, a sifter, right? You throw it all in and what comes out is what's left. And right. so that, that's really the, the kind of theory that I have is let's be bold in all of the places. My, we ain't got nothing to lose. <laughs> right. Well, and uh, there's so many wonderful places we can take this because you, you've hit on so many different things I love. One is that just to revisit the one part, it, you're so right. Like the right medium for the right person is the right choice, right? And there's a difference between being stuck in a way of doing things and viewing all of the options as equally um, viable, right? And so it's not that billboards are the worst. It's just some people are stuck in the sense that they're that that's the only thing they know to do. Right. And so that's what they ring the bell for. But obviously that doesn't work best for everybody. And so at the same time, it's like some people, you know, I remember when I first started getting into social media and it's like, Facebook is the thing, man. Like they, Facebook's going to change the world and change my business. And it's like, it's just one of many, many channels, many opportunities, many places in which to communicate. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not going to be the game changer that you probably think it's going to be. It's going to be a combination of a lot of things. And I think that I love your approach for me. Marketing is holistic. It like it has to fit into everything mm -hmm. and then then that's how you get the strategy out of it it's not just one thing right i mean we we both live in phoenix so think about brandon Rappi. oh yeah totally that's literally what pops in my brain it's everywhere dude he's everywhere but i've literally never seen a digital ad for him and i've mm -hmm. i've talked about him and used his name in many meetings right so if the google machine is true that it follows us at, at whatever great uh i would see digital media and i don't right he's on a, the side of the light rail or the, a bus and he's on dozens of bus stops and billboards and you know if i were to consult for somebody like him the amount of money that he's spending is not even the question but it's looking at the different silos and saying where could we meet other people that need your services that aren't driving right and, and, and that's really, you know, I would take half to a third of their spend on billboards and, and bus stops, and I would diversify it across every digital media that we could. Um, just because it, it doesn't make sense not to, in my opinion. What, why, you know, why limit yourself to people who are driving or walking? Well, it's kind of always like, what's the next step? So it's like, okay, now everyone's talking about him, but what was their plan now? Like now that everyone's talking about him, is there going to be any sort of funnel? Are there going to be ad spend? Is there going to be a mailer that goes to my house? You know what I mean? Like what's next now that like everybody knows you, that's awesome. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make money now unless people have like something somewhere to go with it. Yeah. I mean, you finally got new pictures, which is good. I know. I saw that. I was very excited, <laughs> but it was, it was kind of funny because you know, he's, he's, he's spent like, I mean, I just, I would guess it's like, what do, you, what do you think? Maybe like half a mil? Oh, way more. More than that? Okay. Yeah, I bet he spends 
I bet he spends over a million dollars a year on on that marketing. Yeah, and so it's like, and then he's gone to all that trouble. Now he has a different picture. <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> but hey, whatever. Um, it's uh, okay. So then, so talk to me a little bit about your journey from being what you not you know not vanilla, but certainly not as bold as you are now when you first started brand producer. So like, was there like moments like? <sighs> I guess, I guess I'm asking, was there any definitive moments where you're like, okay, like I actually have to be more different than I am now, or was it just more like gradually accepting yourself for being different or like, how did that happen? Yeah, uh, that's a great question actually. And my four pillars are authenticity, consistency, humanization, and intentionality. Mm. Those, those are the four pillars that I run every client through. It doesn't matter if it's a one-off consulting client, if I'm teaching a class, or if this is a an ongoing you know i'm their i'm their true strategist um everything runs through those pillars when i first started i didn't have those pillars mm. i created a logo and a list of services and i text messaged 400 people right and i was like hey this is what i'm doing if you know somebody i'm the right. guy uh and then as i had to develop what my sir what my process and what my offering really was I developed these pillars and then I developed what what lives with inside them and what actually gives them their strength and foundation because just those words alone doesn't mean shit it it's what it's the cement and how deep each of those pillars really are buried into the ground for me that give them their weight right and it was as I was developing those that I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like quit being a pussy like you're being such a bitch about this you are trying to play safe to find clients that you're not going to want to work with anyway and right. that was the game changer for me. I had a client early into brand producer that I absolutely hated working with. Hated it. But I was like, it's money and money has to, you know, feed my kids and pay my bills. And that was a really pivotal, pivotal moment for me when I, um, when I looked at my interactions with her and decided that this was not going to work. Mm -hmm. I promised myself that day that I would never wear, like when I met with her, I wore a suit coat. The That's hard to, for me to imagine right now. I, yeah, I, I own them. I just don't <laughs> wear them, you know? Um, but when I met with her, I wore a suit coat and I was like, I'm not doing this again. I just categorically am not doing it again. I'm, right. You know, I pitched, uh, I pitched a client wearing a basketball jersey and got them as a client that I still have. No, like the difference between when I started and, and where I am now is like, if I'm going to preach authenticity, then just show up. Yeah. And if, and, and my, my general theory, cause I don't, I don't like being an asshole. I don't like being off putting, but my general theory is if how I look is offensive to you or off putting, you are not going to like the way that I work. So it's almost a little litmus test for me. Right. That if somebody accepts me visually, because, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a coloring book as well. And so having that is one more barrier. And then I show up in jeans and, or, you know, a t-shirt and cut off jean shorts. And that's another barrier. And it's like, if people can embrace who I am visually and, and they know that my value is here up in my brain, then we're going to get along really well. So do you feel like that is because that barrier entry is so high or do you feel like you've done just a, a better than average job um educating the client you know what i mean because like i mean because let's be honest you know people who dress like that showing up to something it's probably gonna be difficult for most people to take someone like that seriously so they've they've got to walk into it knowing something about you ahead of time i would imagine is that true yeah, I mean, uh, I'm pretty fortunate that people like to talk about me. And and I don't say that in an arrogant way, but it's like when when I get referrals, it's because somebody has talked about my, the level of service that I provide or the right. quality of strategy or my willingness to really like break the box open and, and take the restrictions away. Um, but even yesterday, um, you had invited me to Alignable and I was filling out the... Mm, right. I was filling out the, you know, that page. Um, and it said, if you could, what thing do you do better for your clients than your competitors? And my answer was, listen, mm. I actually hear the questions that they're asking and I'm able to speak directly to the question. So uh, if you were to sit in a pitch with me, 
I don't come prepared necessarily. I come ready to listen and let my intuition and, and my heart be a part of that process so that when I'm asked a question or when I'm given what they feel like their problem is, I don't have some bullshit canned response that comes from my pitch deck. Right. Like, I'm, I'm not a fan of pitch decks. I think it's a, it's like wearing a suit. It's like being an asshole and wearing a suit. Like if, if you, you look nice, but you suck as a human, you looking nice is irrelevant. Um, and pitch decks sort of feel the same way to me. And there's nothing wrong with dressing nice. Right. And there's nothing wrong with pitch decks. Right. But right. if your pitch deck is intentional and intuitive and thoughtfully constructed, then it's a beautiful tool. If it's a way to, to oversell your shitty service, that sucks. Right. So the way that I choose to do it is I come in seeming sort of unprepared and I've, I've been called out on it. Like, have you looked at our website? Nope. Have you looked at our social? Nope. Have you looked at? Nope. Why not? Because my intention is to hear what you think your problem is. And then I'll provide a solution to what you think your problem is. And then I can discover what other problems are as opposed to me doing, you know, wasting five or six hours on research just to, make you think like i don't know i don't know overselling <laughs> is not a part of my gig well and realistically when it comes down to it like what they think the problem is is the only thing they're willing to spend money on 100 percent. So. <laughs> and i and i early in early in brand producer i was like well i'm looking at your website and it it seems that uh your call to action is a little weak and it's not quite speaking to who i think your demographic could be and that was not at all what they cared about right like you know, I, I've learned a lot of lessons that have led me to be where I am, both in life and in business. And, and it, it has led me to understand that my truest value is to give my whole heart to something. And, and to do that in a way that is as, as authentically me as I can be without being off-putting. Or, sure. you know, uh, as off-putting as possible. <laughs> and you know who the person is. Right. I'm like, oh, no, I definitely don't want this to work out. Um, <laughs> so when you are sitting down with someone and you just have a really strong feeling about this is where they need to go, um, how do you deal with like, like, for example, when you were, t when you were bringing up the issue about the, uh, the pink sign, right. And that would just be in not, not professional off or whatever else. Um, how, how do you work with people on f kind of finding where that line is? Where like where is too far and where is not far enough? You know what I mean? Because if it's if it's not far enough, it's it's vanilla. It's not going to get noticed. It's just going to be passed just like any other, uh, you know, bus stop sign. If it's too far, you know, we have examples of that throughout history of like people who took marketing too far and it was like offensive and made people mad and tanked businesses. So like how how do you find that line and then how do you walk someone through that? Because obviously they've got fears walking cool. into it because you're you're affecting their business. 100%. Uh, I, I hold it open handed. All of my clients have heard me say, at the end of the day, you're the boss and you can veto anything that I, I suggest. Mm. That's where I start is while they they trust me and they pay me and they've given me some sense of authority over their business and the, and the messaging. I always give it back to them and say, at the end of the day, this is your business. It feeds your family and you can make the decision to veto my suggestion if you'd like. Right. And that paid dividends for me because what it allows my clients to know is that I really am just a human with them. I'm with them in this process. I'm not, I'm not over them in the process. I'm not trying to, you know, flex on them. Like I really understand the weight of what we're doing, but additionally, I am willing to say, look, if this is our, if this is our end goal to get a call as an example, mm -hmm. what can we do? to draw somebody's attention to give us a call and how far can we go? I mean, there are people who are marketing in Arizona in specific industries that I'm like, man, y'all are ballsy. And I think it's ballsy in a bad way because it, it is potentially offensive. Right. It does. I, I've seen some ads recently that I was like, what is actually happening? Like, who told you this was a good idea? And which one of your friends should you slap in the face for not telling you don't do this? Right. Um, and, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's all perception. Sure. And I think I've done enough work 
Um, in, in the idea of it being perception, I think I've done enough work in observing the world, uh, both personally and externally, to have a decent idea of, of where the line is for people. And some of that is just simply in how aggressive I am as a person. Huh. I'm vulgar and I, I look like I look and I come across as, to a lot of people I come across as, I don't give what you think. And that's not really true. I do deeply care what people think. Um, to the point that it gives me imposter syndrome and paralyzes the shit out of me, you know? Right. Um, but the way that I appear to people, I've had to learn how to understand. And so right. I, I have a personal firsthand view of how to know when I've pushed somebody too far. Yeah. No, that, that's so true. I'm, in, I'm like uh, back, I worked at Sprouts for a number of years, uh, interacting with clients, at, uh, like, you know, customers. And uh, it's funny that like kind of intuition you end up getting after a while where you're like, you can kind of just tell by the way someone responds to you, how many words they use, if they look at you, like all of those things, you can kind of take up all those cues and be like, oh, like, this person doesn't want to talk to me or, Hey, this person just needs to like get warmed up a little bit and they'll be fine. And, uh, it seems that way with clients too, is like you said, you know, you can kind of tell when you push them too far, we're like, Oh, okay. Like this is more than just like pushing them to be more adventurous. They're uncomfortable, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so hard to find that line. Cause what, what, I mean, like, I think it sounds, it may seem obvious to you and I, uh, but for a second, you know, talk to a, um, talk to a, a marketing director who has traditionally done traditional media and they're scared about doing new stuff. What are they giving up by not being adventurous and bold? Uh, time and money, you know, like, I think, I think that it's really simple in that way. And and we can look at this in, in any regard, right? Um, I spent a number of years in the Christian church. Um, I'm no longer a part of that same thing in, in the way that I was. So what, what thinking about that, uh, like I was in a lane. I chose a lane and I lived in that lane. And what I missed are so many other beautiful, valuable relationships and worldviews and opinions and, and time spent with really great people that I wouldn't at the time have agreed with. Mm -hmm. But that takes nothing away from their humanity or their humanness um, or our ability to connect. And so I think anything in that, in that is true. When you pick a lane and you just stick to that lane because it feels safe or because somebody's told you that it's the only way that you can go, what you miss are really beautiful, organic opportunities to experience different worldviews and different wins and different successes and different people. And, um, and the things that really make what being a human is to me so valuable. Like one of my kids will fucking only eat chicken tenders and tater tots and shit. And I'm like, and, and I'm like, dude, will you please be adventurous with food? Cause it will make your life so much better. Right. Just the experience of getting out of your own way will make life so much better. And I think that that's true for life. That's sort of a philosophy of mine, but in, in terms of the question you're asking, the marketing director who sticks to traditional media because they're afraid of what's on the other side, that fear is, is fake. That fear is bullshit. There's, I, I, I believe this deeply with my whole heart and soul. There's fear and then there's being scared. Being scared is standing on a 40 foot cliff over some water, being scared that you may not land on your feet if you were to jump. Being afraid while you're sitting at home thinking about being on that ledge is bullshit. It's not real. Right. And so their fear is a totally fake ass construct that I am trying to mentally every day remove. I'm trying to remove the idea that fear is real and exists because it, it, it has paralyzed me at different times in my life. Um, the fear of approval, the fear of failure, the fear of success, the fear of all of those things are so fake that right. what, what we, what we should do is step to the ledge and then determine even if we're scared, are we still willing to jump? Right. And that's, right. that's the advice I would give to that creative director that, you know, manager is to say, are you willing to stand at the edge and jump? Because the, the chances of you landing on your feet and this going really well are way higher 
than you f***ing it up somehow. Well, I think the other big thing, unless you're like spending money on a billboard, and I guess where where my head goes is doing like uh, paid ads on like some of like the emerging platforms and stuff like that that are out there, like the dollar amount to start experimenting in those spaces just isn't that high. No. I mean, for some of them, they are. I mean, like uh, the one space that I've been looking at more recently is like the uh, the OTT ads, the over the top for like some of the streaming services um, that you watch on your TV. Those have a, a pretty high financial barrier to entry. But for a lot of them, like buying ads on Snapchat or TikTok or any of those, like, you know, no one's going to lose their job because they spent like a thousand dollars over the course of a year on TikTok ads. You know, they're just not. And, uh, I, you know, having having some sort of boundaries and framework that you do your experimenting in, I think is, is key too. You know what I mean? And, um, being able to have some sort of way of judging, like, is this good? Is this bad? Did, how did it work out? Because at the end of the day, it's like you said, you gotta, you gotta at least get your feet wet to make a real judgment. Otherwise you're just, um, it's like, what do they say? Like anxiety is like the fear of what if like situations that never, that haven't even happened yet. It's just something you've made up. And, uh, and those do drive decisions though, but it's people like us that have to be able to help people walk through them and understand what they're missing by not jumping, getting to the ledge. (laughs) So, and and that's why, I mean, you're absolutely right. Anxiety is the product of the unknown and in your, in your job and in my job, the reason that I don't push people from the back to the edge of the cliff is because that doesn't go well. Yeah. Yeah. The, what I do is I, I grab their hand and I say, I'm going to lean a little f- further than you, right? I'll take the risk first. I'll look over the edge and then I'll let you know that it's okay. And then I'm going to ask you to join me. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, but I, that's the, the exact reason that I don't push from the back is because it makes people tense up. And that anxiety that's not, the anxiety is real, but the fear is made up. It, it's the culmination of things that we've thought and heard or or heard other people's stories, or, you know, just dreamed up in our imaginations. And it, then we're faced trying to talk somebody out of something that's not real, as opposed to just letting them, you know, gradually see for themselves. And to, to your point, the low barrier of entry on some of this stuff is, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, if somebody has a product, and they're a seller on Amazon, dude, Amazon ads are cheap as shit because it's an underutilized ad platform. Everybody's trying to grab the Google search right. and push them to Amazon as opposed to advertising in the platform itself. And like the, those sort of little nuances, if somebody's willing to trust you and take your hand and, and be led to the, you know, led to the, the cliff, I think it builds trust. I think it builds uh, rapport. It builds longevity. It builds all of the things that we want as business owners and as marketers is we, we want people to trust us. I would much rather have f- five clients for five years than 50 clients for six months at a time. Yeah. Just for the sheer onboarding would just be horrifyingly <laughs> painful. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to get a 50 people. I want to get to know that many people a month. Um, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. So... <sighs> Yeah, I just love that. I just I just love that idea of uh, taking people along for the ride. I guess the thing that I just keep coming back to over and over again is this kind of that idea of being a guide for them. You know what I mean? Like a guy. You know, if you go to like a, a forest in Africa, like you're, the first thing you do is find a guide because he's always he's already been the one like whacking bushes, like finding out where the lions are, and like finding out where the quicksand is, and like helping people get around it. You know what I mean? And and, and that's really why people are, are, are hiring people like us, not only be, for a creative acumen, but just for the sake of like, hey, like we've, we've kind of been over here, like we know what's happening over here and we're going to help you get around that uh, rather than, like you said, pushing them. Because then at that point, you just don't have that buy in, right. you know, and if people don't have buy in, they're just going to be looking for an excuse of why it's going to fail, because ultimately it wasn't their idea. They don't believe in it. And they're going to be looking for any reason why it's not their fault. And why it was your fault and why it's not going to work. And unfortunately, that can totally kill an, a beautiful opportunity. For sure. And and think about the times that you've had to do this too, is instead of just guiding somebody to the edge of the cliff and getting them to trust you that it's going to be okay, you've had to build a slide from the top down to give people an opportunity to go <laughs> from the cliff 
to water with no fear. Right. Right. Like I've had to do that a multitude of times where I, I pitch an idea, then I table the idea because of how the response was. Mm. The response is the cliff, you know, like, or the idea is the cliff. And I, I pitched the idea and I can tell by that, that thing we were saying earlier, you just know when somebody's not into it. And I table the idea and I build a slide from the top of the cliff to the water. And then I let them feel what it's like. And then three months later, I repitched the old idea and they're like, oh yeah, that's, let's do it. Like, <laughs> right. Well, you know what I mean? It's just like anything else. You know what I mean? It's, it's decisions are far more emotional than people give credit to. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's not just facts and figures. Like people ultimately are going to dig in their heels if they don't, if they're not confident and if they're, like you said, too scared. It's just the reality of things. It's a lot of it's emotionally driven. And uh, as professionals, we got to help people walk through those things. Even if they're the person we're talking to is a professional, even if they've been doing it for years, if it's just like a new thing, like you said, if it's a brand new idea for them, they may not want to jump. <laughs> and it's your job and it's my job to make people feel safe. Being an entrepreneur is a huge risk. Yeah. I mean, the, the average outside person with a nine to five looks at entrepreneurship and is like, oh, they just golf all day. Like, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> if my life was as easy as some people think my life is when it comes to being an entrepreneur and running this business, shit. But it's, it's hard and it takes a lot of risk and it takes, there's, there are a lot of anxieties that come with somebody not writing you a paycheck. And it's not just about the money. Yeah. Right? Like, I've got two kids. It's, it's not about the money. It's about the livelihood of, of my children and my family. And it's about so many other things that, that are peripheral to just being an entrepreneur. Um, and so when you, when you are a business owner working with a business owner and you understand how, how sometimes dreadful it is, yeah. you know, that's what makes uh, people like you and I, I hope people like me good at what we do is that listening and that understanding and the human component to say, I get it. I get it. You're about to spend $4,000 on this campaign. That $4,000 could feed your family for a while. I get it. However, that $4,000 is going to turn into 30. Right. So let's, you know, and, and, and it is, it's as much therapy as it is action in most scenarios for me. How do you draw the line between, so I'm just thinking about how like, when, when you said that the first thing I thought of was like, I had gone to one of the breweries here in Phoenix and was was talking with the owner, him and I have a, a great friendship and, and he had bought just like these fat pallets of their beer that they brewed canned. And it was like a $30,000 check he wrote for this stuff, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's so simple. I'm going to sell this eventually because people like this. Right. But then it's funny because then you got to ask the same thing for someone, you know, like, why would I spend, you know, $6,000 on a video because you're going to get your money back. That's why plus some, you know what I mean? And so it's the same, it's the same process, you know, for someone who sells a product, they know that they got to do that investment on the front end to make that ROI. And it's the same thing with the marketing. And I just think that there's probably just a lot of people in the industry and I'm sure I've been guilty of it too, where like, we don't do a good job of connecting the dots between what they're spending and what they're going to get back. And so sometimes I feel like sometimes we end up in this area where like, oh, like, well, we should run Facebook ads because you should run Facebook ads, but not necessarily drawing that line between like, you're going to spend $100 and you're going to get $200 or $1,000 or whatever it is. And without those dots being connected, what we do doesn't matter. 100%. And, and to be honest, that's one of the things that I don't do well in my business is I, I don't, I'm not great at tracking that sort of data all the time. Um, I had a, had a client that um, did 80% year over year from wow. 2019 to 2020. And I can't take all of that credit. Obviously, I'm not, you know, but um, I think the compounded interest of all of all of all that happened over the course of our two years working together certainly plays. Sure. Oh yeah. And so, um, 
that that's always been an interesting thing for me is to to have the reality that you know all of my clients are up year over year literally right. all of them and that's really cool for me um but i i always find myself a little bit in the like well what what do i attach to me you know yeah. like um and at some level it, it's a bit irrelevant because i can show the process and i can show ad spend and i can show increased revenue over ad spend and i can show all those things um but that that's one place that i i don't think i i do all that well because i'm not my brain doesn't quite work that way i'm ultra creative and so right. i find myself looking at data and things sometimes and i'm like yeah i don't care <laughs> yeah that's definitely like on the analytical side for sure like i'm dude i remember like there was one video i was watching uh I know I keep talking about Gary Vee, but I just, I've watched a lot of his videos. So what can I say? But uh, he was just talking about how he has people on his team that they, all they do is like with the ads is they'll experiment with like different background colors. And they found out that it was like yellow or something was the one that got the highest response rate. And I'm like, who sits around just playing around with what background colors, you know, but I mean, it's an element in an ad, just like a headline is just like the images are just like the copy is, you know, all of those play a part. And for someone who's really into analytics, I'm sure they would just love to just tear that apart and get to the bottom of it. But I'm like, I just want to make a video. <laughs> I like, really do. <laughs> I, I've got a, there's a guy that um, runs a company called Two North Advisors who uh, we work together on, on a couple clients and um, I call him the data Christ because his brain does work that way. Like that's awesome. He, he loves the analytic and he's really, really good at creating a roadmap from dollar spent to the, the end of the customer journey. And to watch him do what he does, fucking it blows my mind. Cause I, I'm like, color theory is cool. Can we talk about that? Cause right? this, you know, the analytics, I just I get missed on a little bit, but. Well, that's what is good. I guess it's good that you know him then, right? It is. Because <laughs> you just, you can't be everything to everyone. So. Not authentically, at least. Well, yeah. So you can fake it, I guess. <laughs> but then that would be going against your brand. So. Certainly would. Well, cool, man. Well, do you have anything else that I have not asked you that you think would be worth bringing up before we close things out? No, man. Uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I think we, you know, just some of the, the human elements that we discussed, I think are really helpful for, for anybody to hear really, um, you know, in marketing or advertising or otherwise. So I, I always appreciate your candor and your willingness to communicate and, and really dive into conversation. So yeah. thanks. I've enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Super fun. So I'm glad we were able to do this. It was very exciting. So uh, if you could, um, and of course I'll make sure all this is like in the descriptions and stuff like that of the different sure. places we post, but if you could just share where people can find you, that would be very helpful. Sure. I mean, the easiest place to find me, I, I am a serial entrepreneur who does a lot of different things. So, uh, you know, I, the best place to find me is probably at Dennis Gable on Instagram. Um, brand producer is brandproducer.com. No vowels. I don't like vowels. I have a thing about them. Uh, <laughs> And you know those those are probably the two the two easiest places. Okay, yeah, you're definitely very active on Instagram, so that's that's always nice. You know, there's nothing that pisses me off more than a brand who posts on Instagram and doesn't respond to anything. It's like, what are you doing? This is called social media. It's not a billboard. Right. Ugh, man. Anyway, <laughs> don't even get me started with that. <laughs> it's so annoying. For next episode. I know, right? Just hear me gripe about that. Um, well, cool, man. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, Super exciting. I think you and I just really share a lot of things that we like to really see the big picture. And I think that's huge. You know, it's like we talked about, um, there's so many different aspects to attributing how well things are doing and what can work and what can't work and just being uh, not married to any one particular thing, I just think is so huge. And I, and I hope that's a message that people hear when they, they watch it or listen to it, that uh, don't be married to one thing, to just be willing to try things, be willing to be different, to stand out. And uh, you know what? Push comes to shove. Guess he just had to delete the post, right? If you go too far <laughs> and hope no one sees it. So cool, man. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it was good having you on. So thank you. Thank you, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Later. Wanna cause no problems? Mm. 
I just wanna live my life, but I keep on hearing about nonsense. Me and my dons ain't mobsters, but you know when you see imposters. We know how to read them faces, same way you know how to read them comments. If you wanna talk, let's talk, but right here, make sure you walk and your talk is constant. Hey, I seen it all before I heard chat that they all adore. One week looking like they all aboard. Next day, they don't even walk the walk. I've been here since a bust out aqua, cutting through after all black master. Now I'm too grown for acting gaffer, trying to pay off my Madre's gaff cuz. Took the wife, Lazarus, that's peace.